hayalperestlerin, risk alanların, denemekten korkmayanların cesaretinden doğduk. Bizi asla yarı yolda bırakmayan o sesin rehberliğiyle ilerlemeye ve öğrenmeye devam ediyoruz. Bunun için varız. Bu yüzden gece geç saatlere kadar lambalarımız sönmez. Elveda demek hem hüzün hem de gurur verir. Her şeyi sorgulayarak ve merakımızı besleyerek, dayanıklılığımızı test ederek... Sınırlarımızı aşarak, ilerleyerek ve yeni ufuklar açarak yeni bir yol buluruz. Yeni icatlar çıkararak kendi yolumuzu çizerek. Burası fikirlerin doğduğu ve yeni fikirleri doğduğu, bizim de doğduğumuz, birlikte büyüdüğümüz ve yükseldiğimiz yer. Burası Yakın Doğu Üniversitesi. Good afternoon, dear participants. Welcome to the fourth session of the second day presentations on the third international conference on Cyprus issue, environmental challenges and energy security. In this session, we will be hosting Professor Dr. Hüseyin Işıksal, Professor Dr. Ergün Olgun and Professor Dr. Salih Saner. Welcome, professors. As the first speaker, I would like to announce Professor Dr. Hüseyin Işıksal to make his presentation. Thank you, Mustafa. Uh, first of all, I am. Uh, I would like to salute everyone who is spending their uh, times to watching us, and also I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Zengökçe Kuş and all the uh, and all his team who make this uh, timely and valuable conference uh, possible. Uh, last year, I was the uh, co-president of this conference, so I know how hard work and uh, devotion it requires. So uh, today, uh, I will talk about the importance of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus on Turkey's, uh, Turkey's energy strategy. So um, if I simply put, uh, setting the scene and you know uh, summarize my talk first of all i will talk about very briefly talk about because of the time limits uh, problems regarding to the elimination of maritime jurisdiction areas in the eastern mediterranean then i will uh, try to uh, able to present turkish legal arguments regarding to eastern mediterranean and on the final part uh, i will talk about the importance of trns on turkey's energy strategy so my presentation based on uh, three main pillars so we know that Eastern Mediterranean uh, is a very uh, significant region, uh, culturally, politically, but also in the recent times, we see that uh, geostrategically, it become one of the uh, key region in the world. And uh, in this uh, environment, uh, Turkey's importance is even uh, getting uh, more and more important every single day because Turkey is an energy hub of uh, all the lines uh, passing from, you know, uh, Caucasus, Middle East and uh, transferring to Europe. So uh, simply stating, maritime transportation, energy transmissions, uh, transportation of energy sources, geopolitics, uh, in many respects, Eastern Mediterranean is a key region. So when there's a problems in this region, uh, it's it's definitely has a base it's definitely because of a reason i mean it's not a symbolic causes that cause that make this problem uh, that problematic so that that's the reason why i want to talk about the uh, important very big to talk about importance of the eastern mediterranean so and here you can see you know some of the uh, natural gas pipeline projects as you see you know uh, turkey is already hosting Blue Stream, you know, um, uh, Nabucco, you know, um, Shah Deniz, and there are also many other alternatives uh, in the near future that will make that will make Turkey even more energy hub, especially considering the uh, Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. So, what is the problem? You know, the, the problem, of course, uh, if you're looking from the Greek side, you may approach differently. But uh, if we are approaching from the Turkish side, and I think this is a very objective stating, when we look at the international law, 
international law make it very clear that if you want to make maritime jurisdiction area limitations, and especially if you talk about Eastern Mediterranean, it is a semi-enclosed sea. So we are not talking about open ocean, which every single country can take 200 nautical miles as an economic zone. Because Mediterranean, as I just said, is a semi-enclosed sea. So how you can do this? How you can define your uh, limitations? International law said that it should be agreed between all the relevant countries. So this point is important because you cannot dismiss, you cannot separate, you cannot marginalize any of the countries in the region while deciding about this uh, jurisdiction, maritime jurisdiction areas. And while talking this, the main point is principle of equity. Equity is a very uh, significant term. We are not talking about equal distance. We are talking about equity, which means justice, which means you know you shouldn't uh, underestimate the rights of any participant countries. So in this respect, while we are talking about the facts, it is a fact that Turkey has the longest seashore on the Eastern Mediterranean. This is this is a fact. And it's only 70 kilometers away from the island of Cyprus. But unfortunately, especially Greeks and Greek Cypriots are pursuing a policy that aim to exclude Turkey as the biggest, I'm repeating, longest seashore country, apart from its uh, power in political and uh, economic and geostrategic respect. I am separating it. If we just look Turkey as a, just a geographical entity, it's still the biggest seashore country in the region. And unfortunately, Turkey tried to be excluded in the Eastern Mediterranean hydrocarbon geopolitics. This is the problem. And main aim of the Greek Cypriots and, and Greece is to shrink the Turkish territorial waters by 350%. And reduce it to 41,000 kilometers, and unfortunately, confine Turkey to the Gulf of Antalya, and they call this Sevilla map. European Union authorities have been repeatedly uh, confirmed that Sevilla Harita is not their official map, but one way or another, by supporting the Greek claims, actually, the European Union itself is clashing with its argument. So we still don't know whether Sevilla map is an official standing or not. So here, basically speaking, I will talk about these things, but uh, we see that the, here the distance between Turkey and Egypt is, not, is less than 400 uh, miles. So it's briefly 370 kilometers. So it's one of the reasons that Eastern Median is a semi-enclosed sea, cannot be treated like an ocean. Here are, there are two perceptions, and these two perceptions both has a place in international law. We should say that. But Turkish perception and Greek perception are 100% contrasting with each other. Let's start with the Greek uh, arguments. According to Greek arguments, uh, they think that the easy delimination agreements should be based on median line principle. So they don't care about demographics, population, you know, uh, all the other things that, that has a place within the international law. And they just simply think that let's measure the distance between two countries and throw the, you know, the middle line, median line. And so that's how they make agreement with Egypt, Lebanon, and Israel. And in return, Turkey and TRNC make their agreement uh, on continental shelf uh, on 24 September 2011 not with the median line principle, but the, with the equitarian principle. And here you can see, you know, how two sides approach uh, differs. And as a result, when we look at the Greek perception, which still contrasting with the factual realities, still based on imagination, not the factual uh, realities, they claim that they have a jurisdiction over the whole island, 
And by this way, as you can see, they limited Turkish exclusive economy zone with 41,000 kilometers. And Greece, on the other hand, claiming that even the islands without any population, like uh, Kashot, Kerpe, uh, it also have its own jurisdiction areas. And they also try to base their arguments in this principle. And as a result, you know, inevitably, you can see that both sides, exclusive economic zones, is automatically clashing with each other. And as you can see from the figure is uh, from figure here, one, four, five, six, and seven are the zones that is directly clashing with each other. So Greek sides unilaterally declared 13 you know, uh, zones, and then they even sell these zones uh, to the uh, international companies without, without respecting TRNC and Turkey exclusive economic zones. So here is another area we see that again, where is this clashing? This is Turkish legitimation understanding. And then naturally, as I said, five out of 13 hydrocarbon areas of the Greek Cypriot administration is directly clashing with EEC claims of Turkey. So what about the Turkish perception? As we see, according to Turkish perception, which all has a base within the international law, now I will I will gonna explain to you. And according to Turkish perception, Turkish eco uh, exclusive economic zone is 145,000 kilometers square, as you can see here. And this is how the Greeks claim as the Turkish have. And as you can see that there are 350 percent differences between the two perceptions. So if there's any room for negotiation, let's say 5 percent, 10 percent differences. Maybe two sides come, can come together and sort out the problem. But in this uh, very uh, dilemmatic scenario, we see that we don't see any point of, uh, you know, compromise between the two sides' position because, as I said, there is a huge gap. So let's do a legal analysis. So Greece is a signatory party of UNCLOS, United Nations Agreement on Oceans and Seas of 1982, but Turkey is not a signatory of the UNCLOS. And according to this principle, then we have to follow customary international law. And customary international law, as you, can, as you all know, it depends to the practices, it depends to the legacy. It's not just depend on one single understanding. And approaching from this perspective, all the geographical and non-geographical conditions factors should also be considered within the international customary law. So from this perspective, there are many cases that supporting uh, Turkish arguments, but uh, mainly Nicaragua and Colombia, Romania and Ukraine, Myanmar and Bangladesh are among the uh, most important topics that bears similarities with the Turkish case and actually support that, how Turkish claims are suitable with the international law. So when we look at the Turkish legal arguments, first of all, as I said, all the countries in the region should agree based on the equity principle. And when we look at the Turkish perceptions, Turkey has very strong arguments. The superiority of geography, for example, as I just mentioned, Turkey has the longest seashore in the Eastern Mediterranean. When we look at the proportionality, which, as you can see from the map, even a semi-island like Greek Cypriot administration are claiming, which is which population is less than a million, is claiming much more EEC than 85 million Turkey. I mean, this is against the logic. Forget about the against law, this is against logic, this is against all kind of uh, just understanding of the international law, this is against equity. So Turkey say that geography matters, proportionality matters, economic activity matters, because when we, when we see the Turkish Mediterranean Aegean coast, it has a huge 
economic activity. There are millions of people living there. Millions of people are having a huge economy, including from tourism to you know nuclear reactors to everything. So demographic situation and also non closure which means that Turkey, any ships coming from Turkey has a full right to access to open seas. But under the Greek uh, scenario, the Turkish uh, vehicles cannot even access to the open seas in this scenario. So if I just a little bit further open the Turkish cases, also we see that location of the coast and their relationship, the length of the coastlines, distance between the respective coasts, location of land frontiers, uh, the size of the islands, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all geographical circumstances that supporting Turkish case. Plus, there are non-geographical circumstances also supporting Turkish case, including geological and geomorphological uh, factors, which means origin and development of the topographical features, fishing resources. A uh, number of fishers, you know, who are using this area, environmental facts, navigation, defense and security interests, economic circumstances, historical rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Turkish case is, as I said, is may sound a little bit complicated, but it has a place within the international law, and all of them are justified, especially under the customary international law. So as I said, there are many cases that supporting Turkish case. Here you see, for example, Romania, Ukrainian case, you know, which say that mainland, the superiority of the geography, give advantages to the, in this case, Ukraine against the Romania. Similarly, in the Nicaragua, Colombia case, we see the same proportionality. Instead of dividing just the middle line, you know, the mainland of Nicaragua is taken under under the consideration and similarly Myanmar Bangladesh case all ex supporting the Turkish claims in the Eastern Mediterranean so if I make the sub conclusion in terms of legal analysis when we look at the UNCLOS states have jurisdictional rights over their EEZ content or chef areas but it should be signed between the parties who are that is beneficial fair and equitable for all the parties and main principle is the equitable principle and when we look, approach from this uh, perspective the median line uh, sh shouldn't be the only criteria on defining the EC in addition to this we should also take consideration geographical non-geographical circumstances general configuration of the coast length of the coastlines uh, demographic activity, population, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many cases that is supporting the Turkish case. So the key area of the del delimination maritime jurisdiction area dispute is guess where, uh, of course, Cyprus. And when we look at the Cyprus, I can tell you that the resolution of dispute over the delimination area in the Eastern Mediterranean maritime, uh, maritime jurisdiction areas is the expansion of the Cyprus problem into the sea. So simply stating, what is problem at the land is also the same problem in the sea. And in this respect, we see that TRNC sovereignty, the recognition of TRNC sovereignty over the land, sea and air is essential for the defense of Turkish legal and political rights in the Eastern Mediterranean. And it seems as the most effective way that can prevent maximalist and expansionist steps that Greece and Greek Cypriot administration are planning to take by ignoring all the rights of Turkey and TRNC. And here we all witness an historical moment where Turkish President Erdogan, in his historic speech at the New York UN General Assembly, he called all the countries to recognize the TRNC. This is a turning point. And after this historic call, as all you know, in the uh, Turkish State Leaders Summit, ninth, uh, ninth Turkish State uh, Summit that held in Samarkand, TRNC unanimously accepted as the observer to the Organization of Turkish States for the first time with its constitutional name, which is Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. So this is another fact. So as you see, Turkish side is talking about factual realities, 
rather than virtual realities. So we firmly believe that this is the starting of a new historical era where recognition of TRNC is further open. And again, arguably, we firmly believe that this step will result, will facilitate through an establishment, through a solution in Cyprus that is more just and that is more sustainable. And finally, I want to talk about cooperation proposal of our president, Mr. Ersin Tatar, to the Greek Cypriot site that is offered on the 1st of July 2022. And this proposal, again, that is based on factual reality, is prepared by constructive, forward-looking manner that aiming to have win-win outcome for both sides. So our proposal is definitely for the benefits of both sides. What we simply argue, in addition to the Turkish proposal, which is still on the table, that is May 2011 first, we said that let's establish a committee to be composed of an equal number of members appointed by two sides with the power to jointly decide on offshore hydrocarbon activities. So basically, we, we call for an establishment of a committee for the exploitation of hydrocarbon resources. And also, we make a new opening by accepting all the agreements that the Greek Cypriot side already made, in return that they will also accept the agreement that Turkey side made with, you know, with uh, Turkey, TPO. And by this way, we open the way for cooperation and benefit or two sides of exploit, exploiting hydrocarbon resources, make a huge revenues, not necessarily waiting the final solution of the Cyprus issue. So, and we also put this on the table that decisions taken and arrange, arrangements made in this respect shall not pre prejudice the legal and political positions of Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot sites. So, uh, concluding remarks, if we want a fair, realistic, practical, and sustainable agreement in Cyprus, it could be reached only with the cooperation with good neighborly relations of two sides in Cyprus based on the existing realities on the island. So our new policy, our new standing is, and our proposal, of course, based on a win-win approach where both sides can win in political and economic ways. And we believe that, we firmly believe that this model is the only way that could ensure the island to the island of peace, tranquility and stability. And more importantly, it could be act as a catalyst of solving problems in the whole region when we, when we need this most. And in this respect, where the interest of Turkey, Turkey and TRNC and all the Turkic world is somehow coinciding, it is a great, it's, it's very important that TRNC should be supported internally and externally. And by this way, we believe that this could catalyze for the peace and stability in the whole Eastern Mediterranean. So I would like to thank you for listening uh, and for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Hussein Ishiksal, for your valuable con contributions. Okay, as our next speaker, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Ergun Olgun to deliver his presentation. <laughs> Professor, your microphone is muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, uh, Mustafa, and uh, also thanks to Professor Hussein Shiksa, uh, um, Hussein Gökçekuş uh, for uh, organizing this uh, important uh, meeting at this juncture. Uh, so thank you all. I can hear an echo. Uh, how can we deal with that? Um, uh, Professor, if you can uh, lower your speakers. Okay. I'll try to do that. Do you think that's okay? We don't hear any echo, Professor. Okay. 
I think it's much better now. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, what I will do, I will do my presentation in three sections. Uh, the first section, I will talk about um, a brief background uh, of uh, of the Cyprus issue, so that people understand. Since this topic is um, the um, environment, the Cyprus issue and environmental challenges, I will briefly talk about the Cyprus issue as well before I go into the uh, subject of uh, challenges that we face and finally i will talk about uh, the turkish separate cooperation proposals on which professor shuksal has already touched a little bit but in any case i will i will expand a little bit more beyond what professor shuksal has mentioned first let me just say that um, uh, cyprus is at the crossroads between east and west as well as uh, north and south uh, in the geography it's placed it guards the exit of the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean, through which 12% of uh, the world trade goes. So it's at a strategic position. It also, um, through the Suez Canal, about 30% of uh, con the container trade, global container trade, goes through. So you can understand that Cyprus is strategically placed. And uh, uh, as such, uh, practically all global actors uh, have some kind of a presence in Cyprus. They're all uh, sort of uh, mingled in one way or the other in the Cyprus issue, which complicates the matter even, even further, the Cyprus issue even further. Cyprus got its independence from Great Britain in 1960 as a partnership republic constituted, co-founded by the Turkish Cypriot people and the Greek Cypriot people. So it's in the form of, it was in the form of a partnership republic and sovereignty was delivered to the two peoples of the island as the two equal co-founders uh, of, of the republic. Uh, sadly, uh, the Greek Cypriots, who unfortunately see Cyprus as their own, um, staged a coup in 1963 and usurped the partnership republic of Cyprus and turned it into a 100% Greek Cypriot republic and that's the root cause of the Cyprus issue. Since then, we've had conflict, violence, of course, instability uh, in Cyprus, um, which is now, unfortunately, after nearly 60 years of uh, negotiation for a new form of power sharing has failed and is now spilling into the Eastern Mediterranean and even be beyond. So basically, um, unless the root cause of the Cyprus issue is addressed, and uh, the uh, equal status and equal rights as inherent equals of the two sides is respected, we will not be able to solve the Cyprus issue and it will continue to have a negative influence in the Eastern Mediterranean and even globally, particularly between two NATO allies and, uh, uh, of course, uh, the security of the region would be at risk. Just to give you a quote, in his uh, Good Offices Mission Report of 9th July 2021, the UN Secretary General stated in his report that, and I'm quoting, the peace process in Cyprus is sui generis. Uh, the Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots have equal inherent rights. I underline that, inherent right, equal inherent rights, and engage in negotiations as equals in the process. Sadly, the Greek Cypriots continue to, to disrespect the inherent equality of the Turkish Cypriot people, th thus resulting in the failure of uh, UN settlement efforts, which have been continuing for nearly 50 years now, more than 50 years now, in Cyprus. Uh, but, of course, we are sharing uh, a small island and need to have a positive working relationship with the Greek Cypriots based on respect for each other. And uh, to end uh, this 60-year-old conflict, the Turkish Cypriot side is prepared to negotiate the arrangements needed for a structured cooperative relationship with the Greek Cypriot side based on the equal status and inherent sovereign equality of each other. So that's the sort of a brief uh, background of the Cyprus issue, and we need to understand that and understand that uh, to be able to, uh, to move forward. Now, I come to challenges. Naturally, in addition to the political challenge we face on the island, we have other challenges, uh, and that's the topic of this of this conference or of this uh, uh, discussion we are having. 
both Cyprus, uh, both sides in Cyprus are currently facing problems, issues like, for example, human rights, uh, human issues like uh, irregular migration, environmental issues like uh, CO2 emissions, and energy issues uh, like the ones that we will be discussing, which no longer can wait for a political settlement in Cyprus. They need to be addressed because the Cyprus issue is dragging on, but these are pressing issues that need uh, prompt attention if we are not going to be defeated by those problems and cause more damage on ourselves as all parties involved in the problem. In fact, the UN Secretary General has repeatedly been saying that the absence of a political settlement, uh, it, that in the absence of a political settlement, the two sides need to put aside their differences and address pressing practical issues. Uh, of course, this means that there is, he, don't, he doesn't see uh, any uh, possibility of a political settlement in Cyprus in the short run, but he sees that there are issues that need prompt attention. He is uh, pointing out, for example, that the natural resources around the island should benefit both sides and should constitute a strong incentive for the parties to find a mutually acceptable and durable solution in Cyprus and to engage deeper uh, to engender deeper regional cooperation. So that's, uh, that's the vision with which we agree that we, we could park the Cyprus issue to one side and concentrate on pressing practical issues uh, that we need to concentrate on. But then, of course, coming to environmental issues, to energy issues, the, the key standard setter on environmental issues in our region is the European Union, which has been developing climate and renewable energy policies designed to achieve the goal of decarbonizing the entire EU economy by 2050. The EU Renewable Energy Directive's objective is to ensure that by 2030, at least 32% of all energy consumed in the EU will come uh, from renewable energy uh, sources. Although the invasion of Ukraine, uh, which has, uh, I mean, which some believe has, is overshadowing this, this, uh, this vision of the European Union, I don't think uh, of course, with, with the sanctions imposed on Russia, have had a devastating impact on the supply chain of natural gas in Europe, forcing European countries to look into alternative sources of natural gas. This cannot, I believe, delay the pressing need of decarbonizing of hydrocarbon of power systems and transition to renewable energy technologies. The Eastern Mediterranean region, I mean, this is where the Eastern Mediterranean comes in, in which the island of Cyprus and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus is currently placed, is poised to play a significant part in this transition period to renewable energy on two counts. First, through joint action, and this is the es essential element, this is the critical element necessary, through joint action, the natural gas resources of the Eastern Mediterranean belonging to Egypt, Israel, and the island of Cyprus can help in partly, uh, I, I underline the word partly, meeting the pressing uh, natural gas needs of European countries. And secondly, the TRNC, together with the Greek Cypriots, Greek Cypriot side, Egypt and Israel, can be significant generators of solar energy in the process of transition to renewable energy, again, through joint action and interconnectivity to the European Union electricity grid. So there are uh, two roles that uh, we in the Eastern Mediterranean, if we act jointly, can play in, in dealing with the challenges faced uh, both in the region and also in Europe. These, of course, necessitate forward-looking cooperation between Egypt, Israel, the TRNC, and the Greek Cypriot Republic of Cyprus, the securing of such cooperation will help the realization of four, if you ask me, four objectives. Uh, one, to prepare the ground for political settlement in Cyprus by creating the needed confidence by working together, creating con confidence as well as institutions that cooperate can help prepare the ground 
for political settlement. Secondly, it could uh, help in the transition to renewable energy. Thirdly, it could provide for energy security. And fourthly, uh, cooperation and stability in the Eastern Mediterranean. So it can serve four purposes at the same time if we can achieve the objective of cooperation between the Turkish, uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, the Greek Cypriot Republic of Cyprus, Egypt and Israel. Maybe these are uh, sort of uh, objectives that may seem difficult, but with foresight and with uh, uh, focusing on mutual interest and avoiding uh, unilateralism, we may be able to achieve these objectives. And I think we should be working towards such goals. So we come to uh, the Turkish separate proposals to be able to facilitate uh, the objectives that I have uh, uh, listed about. And with those thoughts, the TRNC president, Ersin Tatar, has made six proposals to the Greek Cypriot side on the 1st and 6th of July this year. And these include, among others, cooperation on the exploration and exploitation of offshore hydrocarbon resources and cooperation on the development of solar energy. So that it, I will focus of the six proposals on two of uh, the proposals made. The hydrocarbon resources around the island are, of course, co-owned by Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots as the two co-owners of the island of Cyprus. The discovery of hydrocarbon resources has unfortunately turned into a curse, into an area of contention instead of uh, a blessing uh, for the two sides. And the cause of this is the unilateral action of the Greek Cypriots saying that they are the single owners of these resources, despite the fact that the island of Cyprus is co-owned by the two sides, and this is universally accept accepted. And as the Secretary General is saying, it has to benefit both sides because they are co-owners of this resource. Preferring uh, diplomacy over unilateralism, the Turkish Cypriot side has put forward three constructive proposals in starting from 2011 to 2012, and of course, uh, the previous one in 2019, to foster cooperation on hydrocarbon exploration and exploitation aimed at turning this crisis into a mutually beneficial opportunity and a blessing. The latest Turkish Cypriot proposal of 1st July 2022, this is one of, the, one of the six, envisages the establishment of a joint committee to be composed of an equal number of members appointed by the two sides through such a committee, decisions on offshore hydrocarbon activities, including revenue sharing, could be jointly taken by the Turkish Cypriot side and the Greek Cypriot side. Agreements could include a proviso that decisions taken and the arrangements made in this respect will not prejudice the legal and political positions of the Turkish Cypriot side and the Greek Cypriot side on the Cyprus issue. And the joint committee could operate with the facilitation and in the presence of the United Nations with the European Union as observer. So it's, it's an inclusive process uh, facilitated by the United Nations, but also in which uh, the uh, European Union could act as, a, uh, as an observer. The proposal also suggests the involvement of the energy companies that have been separately licensed by the Turkish Cypriot side and the Greek Cypriot side by creating a mechanism whereby they would be authorized by the contracting sides. Such a joint mechanism could be entrusted with cooperation on and coordination of future offshore activities, future contracts and issues related to monetizing and sharing, as well as recommendations on the transfer of these resources to international markets. So it's an inclusive element involving both sides, but at the same time, uh, companies that have been licensed so far to be engaged in the process for the mutual benefit of all. Regarding the shared objective of transition to green energy, the Turkish Cypriot side has proposed the establishment of another uh, joint committee to explore the maximum utilization of solar energy including investments throughout the island, not only the, in the north, not only in the south, but throughout the island through cooperation. And that's, that's why it could contribute for the, for the political settlement of the Cyprus issue. The two sides will show, we develop some kind of a model to be able to facilitate coexistence 
and cooperation on the island to the benefit of both Turkish Cypriots and, and Greek Cypriots. To supplement this, pro this proposal, the Turkish Cypriot side also offered the um, electricity interconnectivity of the island with, the, with Europe through Turkey, which is already connected with the former, with, with Europe, uh, by using the existing interconnected electricity grid between the two sides on the island. The two sides on the island are already interconnected. Turkey is interconnected with Europe. And through uh, a, a, a interconnectivity, a cable with uh, Turkey, we can connect uh, to Europe. This would, of course, enable further expansion of the use of green energy on, on both sides by contributing to the stability of both electricity grids and the ensuring of a balance between energy generated and energy consumed, uh, thus avoiding grid imbalances and overloading. This would also facilitate the utilization and trade of renewable energy among interconnected countries, facilitating for export of solar energy uh, from uh, Cyprus, particularly in the summer season when uh, we have an abundance of sun uh, in this part of the world, uh, Cyprus and of course Egypt and, and the other countries in the region, Israel in the, in the region. Because of its proximity, the prospect of establishing a connection with Turkey is definitely more cost effective and has the added premium of contributing to the cooperation and rapprochement both in Cyprus and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, coming back to lessons that can be learned, both sides have a lot to learn from the agreement reached between the government of Israel and Lebanon in their agreement facilitated by the United States to establish a permanent maritime boundary by conveniently parking their pending political differences uh, to one side and addressing the uh, pressing issues of delimiting de de of the delimitation of their uh, maritime boundary, both Israel and Lebanon have equally benefited from this historic achievement. I think that's a major example from which we can benefit. Uh, if the Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots can park their political problems to one side, which which may which will which seems to be taking a lot of time, then may, they may be able to address and benefit from the uh, hydrocarbon resources of the region before uh, time runs out uh, for them to exploit these resources in view of the time frame that the European Union Union has for the exploitation of fossil fuels. Both the region and also the both sides uh, will, usually, will definitely benefit from such an achievement if we can learn these lessons. And this would be for the benefit of uh, uh, the region and global benefit in terms of security, stability and prosperity. I would like to end here and hope that we will have the foresight and the forward-looking approach, not only in Cyprus, but also globally, to facilitate and prepare the ground for this kind of vision uh, to take foot uh, so that we may be able to achieve uh, this objective. The Turkish Cypriot side is prepared uh, and uh, uh, my office, uh, which leads the uh, contacts with the Greek Cypriot side and with, with the outside world, in addition to our foreign ministry, is more than ready and is prepared with this vision to take this um, positive step forward and engage with the Greek Cypriots and with the rest of the world to facilitate the realization of this objective, which will which will serve the purposes not only of Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, but uh, all the uh, regional countries as well as, as well as uh, global interests in the region. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share our views in this regard. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Professor Ergun Olgun, for being with us and for your valuable presentation. Okay, as our next guest. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Salih Saner to deliver his presentation.
Hello everybody. I would like to thank to all people who get involved in organizing this event, this conference. My topic is my topic is not political. It's going to be a little bit technical, introducing a energy source. I couldn't move this sun. Okay. Uh, I am going to introduce unconventional hydrocarbons, talk about advantage, disadvantage of hydrocarbons, fossil fuels, economic and strategic importance, unconventional hydrocarbons and varieties, unconventional potential of the world. What is the, how much, I, I really spent some time, uh, you know, the reserves are always given for the world, but after conventional, what will be the reserves? What will be the, what, what is potential and how long it's going to last? This is what will be at the conclusion of this paper will be presented. Years ago, we received this uh, figure showing that the sources, we have two, two, we are separating, we are dividing two energy sources to two. One is fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. And the other one is uh, alternative energy, which is, includes nuclear energy, uh, hydroelectric, and renewables. And re renewables are very popular today. Day by day, they are increasing, increasing. So here, in this renewables, nuclear energy, and fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are going to be finished. Everybody is saying it's going to be finished. In 1965, Israeli-Arab war, people were talking about the oil is going to finish, the hydrocarbons will be finished. Uh, since then, hydrocarbons increased too much, it not finished. And after, to, of course, they are consumable. We are going to uh, consume it one day, but how long more they are going to continue? And uh, gradually, we are having renewable energy, renewable energy, trying to replace this fossil fuels. Uh, if you know what is renewable, you may get benefit of it in the future. My professor used to tell us uh, in the classroom when I was a student, if you do not know uh, what you are looking for, you are not going to understand it. So we have to know something about them. Here you are seeing renewable energy. When I say renewable, mainly we are having solar, which is yellow one, solar, wind, and others. others. The dominant one is wind energy so far, and it is increasing too much. And uh, solar energy is following solar. In Cyprus, we are also having solar systems. Government giving permission to put solar systems uh, or to houses, but Cypriots are very clever uh, uh, people, you know, immediately they start building solar systems and today it is the capacity is full. You, they are not giving any more permission because it has a limitation. We are having, when we say fossil fuels, crude oil, natural gas, and coal, because geologically they are formed from fossils, from uh, uh, living uh, plants or animals. And will be finished, we are saying, and the cost is increasing. Why do we want to look for other sources? Because, because it's going to be finished one day, we have to find something. Because of high cost, we have to find a cheaper one. 
They are pollutants, polluting the environment, causing global warming. Because of these reasons, we are looking for, you know, uh, uh, renewable energy, which are more clean, carbon free. So, uh, What are we using on Earth as energy source? The mostly used is oil. This one is showing y-axis is showing the percentage, and these are the years. You know, oil is used more than anything else. Coal and gas. So fossil energy. How are you going to get rich and replace them? You see here we are having other sources, uh, hydroelectric, or we have wind energy and nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is slowing down a little bit, but I don't know in the future what will happen. As fossil fuels are reducing, you need something to take place of them. And uh, we are calling alternative energy, nuclear, hydro, hydroelectric, and renewable energy. They are alternative energy for fossil uh, fuels. We said one of them is solar, and other one is wind. Uh, these two can be possible in our land in Cyprus. And as I told you, we already reached to the maximum capacity in Cyprus. If we have connection to Turkey, cable connection, we are going to increase the capacity and we may have more solar energy. Wind is something that it looks like it is possible, but so far we don't have any installations. Geothermal is not possible in Cyprus, geothermal energy. Only it is possible to come up with heat pump applications because if you drill a well uh, 20, 50 meters deep, uh, the temperature is 22 degrees centigrade, which is most suitable temperature for human life. Uh, some application in South, South Cyprus, we can see them, you know, that taking uh, heat from 50 meters deep and circulating in the buildings. That is possible, but in North Cyprus, no applications now. Biofuels, we don't have, you know, some people uh, studying on them. Waste, electricity from waste, wave currents, uh, these are not also applicable in uh, Cyprus. Uh, wave could be, but uh, currents uh, occurring due to tidal movements is not so effective. Hydrogen, so in Cyprus, when you say uh, alternative energy or when you say uh, renewable energy, we have to concentrate on solar. How can we increase solar energy and wind energy, I think. Others are all, people are doing some academical research, uh, still uh, no conclusions. And uh, we have another source, this is, which is a topic here, unconventional hydrocarbons. Unconventional hydrocarbons. What is, what is this unconventional hydrocarbon? Uh, there are many uh, descriptions here on this table, but I don't want to go through all of them. Briefly, we have conventional reservoirs that we are using today, and on the other side, unconventional. This conventional and unconventional occurrence and accumulations are different to all of them. And source rock, reservoir rock relationship, they are different. Uh, reservoir quality is different. Conventional reservoirs usually depends on uh, good quality reservoir rock, 
but unconventional is uh, the quality of the reservoir rock is not good. We are trying to get hydrocarbon from them. Uh, production technology exploitation is different between two. Uh, and exploitation cost is also different. Like uh, uh, conventional, uh, if the cost is you know, $28 uh, per barrel, unconventional is going to cost exploitation cost is going to cost 40 to 80 more expensive but you are going to get extra hydrocarbon from the reservoir i am sorry all of them are shifted here but still we can follow these slides uh, in production of a conventional reservoir we have primary production, secondary production, tertiary, which is primary is uh, it has natural flow, and uh, we are also injecting water uh, in secondary, uh, water and pressure maintenance. But in the tertiary stage, we are injecting something which is not available in the reservoir. It can be a microbial, chemical injection, gas injection, thermal injection into the reservoir to get extra hydrocarbon. Once you start this one, it is an unconventional, but the unconventional application on conventional reservoir. Uh, unconventional reservoirs in my list, I have nine different types. One is mature fields, this conventional, which I explained. Heavy oil reservoirs and tar sands, tight oil. So I'm going to come one by one to explain them a little bit. In a reservoir, when you start producing, you, this curve is going up. Your daily production is increasing. So this is daily production and this is time. Daily production is increasing and then after a peak point, it is decreasing. So we are saying that the field is mature, mature field. If it is mature, it means it's going to drop, so you can start applying enhanced oil recovery, injecting something to the reservoir. And uh, uh, all the conventional reservoirs, we are saying uh, uh, we have a proportion of the reserve there that we can produce. It is called proved reserve. Our age on Earth is 30% is proved reserve, which is if you go to BP uh, reference list and other, others, others, uh, this is the value they are giving as reserve. And the remaining 70% is residual. You cannot produce it with primary methods. You have to apply some techniques to get it. So in the future, we are going to try to get this one also from the reservoir, this blue area. But blue area, after pro production, uh, the blue area, you are going to have a proportion of the oil is still that you can never, never bring it to surface. Total reserves, uh, 1,732 trillion barrels of oil we have, given in uh, statistics. And how much is total? How much is total? Total is 5,773 trillion barrels. So I have I have lots of oil which is remaining on their surface as an unconventional volume, too much. And second one that I'm going to talk about is heavy oil. Heavy oil is something underground in the rock. Uh, which is uh, very heavy and viscous. It doesn't 
flow at reservoir temperature. This is going to be a reserve. These are not included into the reserves today. Whatever you can produce is considered as approved reserves. So these are not included. Third one, uh, sorry, uh, the second one, we have a good example. In Batıraman in Turkey, we have a heavy oil, Batıraman, and 1% was producible, 1% only. After that, they started applying carbon dioxide injection, and they are getting 10%. So 90% are still there. How can I get that 90%? And uh, tar sands are a mixture of sand and oil, heavy oil, heavy oil, like this. This is oil. Is it sandstone or oil? It is mixture. And these things are available on the surface also and in subsurface, underground. Tar sands. Tar sands is famous in Alberta, in Canada, and either if it is on the surface, they are open mining, shoveling the tar, and bringing to a uh, installation factory, uh, extracting hydrocarbon portion from that one. Open, open mining. Or they are, they are using, uh, you know, uh, in situ, for example, in this one, there are two horizontal wells. To, you start vertical and you go with horizontal, horizontal, and you start injecting something. Either you uh, inject uh, steam or chemical or something, and from the other one, you are getting tar or heavy oil out. This is also unconventional. Tight oil is something like this. In the rocks, there is no porosity, there is no permeability, but there is a, a, a tar like hydrocarbon in the rock. This could be produced by drilling a horizontal well and going with fracturing, hydraulic fracturing. So two technologies are very important uh, in petroleum industry. One is we used to drill vertical before. Now we are using vertical and going horizontal. And also, we are doing a fracturing, controlled fracturing in the reservoir to increase the flow uh, to the well. In this way, tight oil reservoirs are exploited today. And then tight gas, like tight oil, tight gas we have. Tight oil and tight gas, they are not in the same reservoir. They are. Uh, occurrence, uh, source generation types are different. And shale oil, shale is a laminated, this is very famous. You hear it, Kayagaz in Turkish people, you know. Uh, shale is a laminated rock, low permeability, no permeability, so nothing can flow. And it has, it has oil in the rock. It is something like olive oil, olive oil uh, factory that the, they are squeezing the basket filled by broken olives and the oil oil is coming out but in this rock oil already came out maybe or uh, squeezed and some remained you cannot take 100 percent there is some remaining oil in the source rock uh, so this source rock is becoming a reservoir rock also this is called shale oil. And similarly, we have shale gas. As I told you, in many places, oil and gas in the conventional reservoirs may be in the same reservoir, but here, uh, unconventional shale gas, unconventional uh, shale oil, they are coming different. 
the shale gas is similar to we have a horizontal well drilling and again hydraulic fracturing to increase the flow into the well. And uh, one more, two more actually, coal bed methane is another one. This is if you have coal, well in Cyprus we don't have coal, but you have to be knowledgeable about it. The coal, in the coal we are usually having methane, methane. And uh, gas generated by microbial and thermal processes, uh, usually they are uh, absorbed by the organic matter, coal is organic, and also free gas is available in pores, the coal is having some porosity. And also if there is water in the uh, coal seam, some gas is dissolved in the water. And uh, the last one that I'm going to show is gas hydrate. This is uh, burning ice. Usually it is available in uh, polar areas near North Pole, in Russia, it, they have on the shallow uh, areas on the surface. And it is commonly found in oceans, seas at the bottom of the sea. What is that? It is, it is ice, ice, water, frozen water, and methane is encapsulated inside the crystal of the ice. When it is cooled down, it is shrinking under pressure. Therefore, if you get one cubic meter of hydrate, this ice, one cubic meter is going to give you 164 cubic meters of methane. Under shrinking, under cold and pressure, it is shrinking 164 times. So if you get uh, more than that, one cubic meter of gas is going to give 164 cubic meter of methane and 0 0.8 cubic meter of water. This is very important. Huge amount of gas available. These are usually at the bottom of the sea surface of the ground as uh, sedimentary deposits in the bottom. And the amount of this one on Earth is 20,000 trillion cubic meter, what they are calculating. And some investigators say, you didn't, uh, it is not possible to explore all the oceans. So they are estimating it is not 20,000 trillion cubic meter, it is 706 uh, uh, trillion uh, cubic feet, they are saying. And uh, uh, it is about So it is same, sorry, I mixed here. It, if you convert this one, this is this one, and some investigators are giving 35 times more than this, 35. And now I am going to calculate how much it makes and tell you how much it's going to last. One problem here, gas hydrate is too much, volumetrically, huge amount of gas we are having, but unfortunately today still scientists are working on it. There is no exploitation production method yet, which is feasible, which can be feasible. And in Turkey, around Turkey, we have gas hydrates, wide, wide areas are gas hydrate, and in Mediterranean area, this is Antalya here, Rhodes and uh, Antalya, 
and Exumander Mountains under water, uh, they are covered with gas hydrate. You see why why uh, other Greece is trying to get uh, exclusive economics done here. And uh, now we are going to come up with the uh, volumetric calculations. This is about uh, oil, oil reserves. Oil reserves, if you go to estimates, if you read it articles on articles, uh, they are saying uh, we are going to have 50 years more for oil and let's say 50 years more for gas. And when I included uh, unconventional reserves here, the picture is changing. You know, from different areas, we are going to check total, not the different countries. Uh, we are having recoverable versus geologic. Geologic is not recoverable with ordinary methods, but in the future we are going to produce them. Without gas hydrates, I didn't include gas hydrate. Other than the gas hydrate, we did calculation. Unfortunately, it is blocking down here. Uh, uh, I cannot see it. Uh, because uh, the machine, you know, is not accepting my slides, maybe. Uh, let me go to the gas also. Uh, gas is often. Gas, again, gas hydrates are not in this one. Gas hydrates, other than gas hydrate. Uh, we are going to have uh, geologically 29,170 70, uh, uh, trillion cubic feet of gas. And this is, this is with conventional. If you go to this, this is unconventional. This one is conventional. So conventional is going to last for uh, 50 years. So this one is going to last uh, uh, 110 uh, years. I am going to repeat this uh, information with another slide. Oil potential. We are going to have oil potential. Uh, we are having total this much conventional reset, and some is producible reserves today and some is not producible, we are going to work on this volume to get more. And today, this much we can get conventional, and we have, uh, we have more to try to get. And remaining for over, that there will be a portion, 20 percent, I said, uh, uh, will be residual in subsurface forever is this much, 1,154 trillion barrels. Therefore, we have global geological unconventional oil is 3,441 billion ton. Uh, and producible oil potential con uh, is this much. So if you take into account this volume, it's a little bit mixed up. Mixed up. Uh, it is going to last 235, I, I hope it is seen, 235 years not 50 years. 235 years more we are going to use oil. And for the gas, gas is also calculated without uh, considering the gas hydrates first. Uh, and uh, we have mixed up slides. Uh, uh, 
it is going to last uh, 110 years, even the number is lost, 110 years, but if you, if human being, as human being, our research, our efforts uh, give a result in production, we are going to have huge amount of gas, which is going to last 500 years or more. Even it may go to thousands of years because oceans are large and we don't know where are the high trees are located today. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, whoever listened to us.